Good evening and welcome. My name is Dominique Colloman, member of class of 2001, Franklin College of Arts and Sciences with degrees in psychology and sociology, and the class of 2004 with a dual degree with a master's in sport management from the Mary Frances Early College of Education and the School of Law. Welcome to our second Between the Pages. I'm here tonight as your host representing the UGA Alumni Association Board of Directors, where we work hard to promote and support the initiatives and missions of the Alumni Association. At the University of Georgia, learning doesn't stop when our diploma arrives in the mail. We are a community of lifelong learners committed to continued growth and inquiring into the nature of things as we have been taught to do. We're spirited and passionate between the hedges, but also between the pages where we're curious, open-minded, and ready to explore new worlds and voices. With over 327,000 alumni, the UGA Alumni Association strives to create diverse programming to help connect us all around the world. This new virtual book club, Between the Pages, provides an opportunity to enjoy and discuss works by alumni authors with fellow Bulldogs. Let's talk about our guest tonight. Our author tonight of American Marriage Tiari Jones. She's a New York Times bestseller author and a 2018 inductee into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. She attended UGA in the 1990s, the best time to have been there. An American Marriage is an Oprah's book club selection and appeared on former U.S. President Barack Obama's summer reading list. She's an author of four novels. American Marriage was awarded the Women's Prize for Fiction, formerly known as the Orange Prize, Aspen Words Prize, and an NCAAP Image Award. It has been published in two dozen countries. She's also a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, which has, and has been a recipient of the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, the United States Artist Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, and Radcliffe Institute Bunting Fellowship. Her third novel, Civil Sparrow, was added to the NEA Big Read Library of Classics in 2016. Jones is an Andrew D. White Professor at Large at Cornell University and the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing at Emory University. Our moderator tonight is Deborah Roberts. Since graduating from UGA in 1982 with a degree in broadcast news, Deborah Roberts has risen through the ranks of television news, receiving numerous awards and has been a regular reporter and contributor for programs such as Dateline NBC, 2020, Nightline, and Good Morning America, to name a few. In 1990, she began her career with NBC News as a general assignment correspondent. She covered stories in the Southeast from the Atlanta and Miami bureaus and was dispatched to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, reporting on um, actions leading up to the Persian Gulf War. She was later named a magazine correspondent for Dateline NBC and reported from Barcelona during the 1992 Olympics. This earned her an Emmy nomination for that coverage. In 1992, she received a UGA Distinguished Alumnus Award. This is presented annually to recent graduates who have excelled rapidly in their professions. Deborah joined ABC 2020 in 1995. Since then, her curiosity has taken her around the world from Bangladesh, where she reported on women's maternal health, to Africa, where she has traveled extensively throughout the continent, telling stories about the AIDS and HIV crisis. And you may recall her Emmy-winning report on a woman who discovered her long lost mother in an African village. She's won numerous awards for her work, including a Clarion Award for coverage of abuse within the Amish community. Deborah will lead tonight's discussion with Tiari for about 20 minutes or so, and afterwards there will be time for you to submit questions. So please be thinking about what you want to ask. I know I had a list of questions. Deborah, will you please proceed with leading our discussion with Tiari tonight? But before I turn it over to Deborah, I just want to pause. We know for the last seven months that there's been members of our community who have been in pain and have been hurting. We've heard about incidents occurring on our campus in Athens. And we also know with the news coming out of Louisville this afternoon that there's pain. I know I feel that pain. And tonight is special for me to take a moment to just step away and enjoy fellowship, not only with alums, but an author that I admire, but a news correspondent that I also admire, to give us space to process those feelings, to have a conversation about a book that has come to mean so much to a community of women. 
thank you for giving your time with us tonight. And um, I look forward to tonight's discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tiari. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, as you just heard, I'm Deborah Roberts. And Dominique, thank you for that beautiful, beautiful intro. And it is such an honor and a pleasure, Tiari, first of all, to get a chance to meet you. And as Dominique said, especially right now, given so much of what's going on in this country and your writing, which of course touches upon some of the pain that our country has faced for a very long period of time. Um, you captured so beautifully in your novel, which I'll give you a little plug here, An American Marriage, um, some of the struggles, of course, of African-American men and women in this country. And it is such an honor to get a chance to meet you. I was saying to you a little bit earlier, I had this book um, a couple of years ago when it first was released in 2018. My son gave it to me as a gift and I had put it on my nightstand and somehow just through work, you know, just didn't really get a chance to pick it up in the way that I probably should have. And I finally did. And boy, 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 what a read. I want to start off by asking you, first of all, we, we should talk about, and Dominique mentioned all the awards and, and, the, and the notations that you've gotten for this book. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. In fact, what did it feel like? Let me start. I was going to ask you about the book first, but what did it feel like when you got the call from Oprah saying, this is my book club pick? Well, you know, I often think about Oprah and the many pleasures of being Oprah. I'm sure there are pleasures of being Oprah that we can't even imagine. But one of them is that she likes to make the call in person and change your life. And she doesn't let, you don't have any idea the call is coming. The book was about five months away from publication. I was just driving my car, minding my own business. <laughs> and the phone rang and it was a block call. And I answered it because I feel that every block call is a story. I mean, <laughs> you're one of the few people who does that. Somebody blocked that call for a reason. So I said, hello. And she said, hey, it's Oprah. And, and you said, I, somebody's punking me. No, she has such a distinct voice. You would know it anywhere. And I would say that as any good Southern woman, I said, ma'am. <laughs> And she says, I really like your book. Um, I want to choose it for my book club. What do you think? And I said, oh my gosh. Yes, ma'am. That would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. Like, that would be nice. As you're driving and about to have a wreck, I'm sure. No, I pulled over. I pulled over and put on my yes. flash. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Well, that must have been quite a moment. And I remember when she announced that book club and I thought, oh, I've got to get that book. And I got it right away. And of course, read it much later. There's so much to get to in the book. And I have to tell you, I'm actually happy that I waited to read it later because it's so fresh in my mind right now. And I've talked to some friends who read it a couple of years ago. I want to start off by asking you about the whole concept because uh, you know, and I usually I'll say I don't want to spoil it, uh, but we've got readers here who've either finished reading it or they're in the process of reading. So I'm not going to worry about spoiling anything because we have to talk about these characters. But you deal with so much in this book, and I want to find out uh, your thinking because when you wrote this book a few years back, we were not in this time that we're in now. We certainly were in a time of trouble as we have been for a long time, particularly uh, with Black American men in this country, but we are in a very particular time of pain, as Dominique alluded to. And I'm curious when you wrote this book, I mean, it feels so relevant now. Would, did you have any idea that it would be just as relevant, sadly, a couple of years down the road in the way that it has been this year? I mean, the, sometimes people say to me, wow, you know, you wrote this book, because I started writing this book in 2011, and they would wow. say, but I mean, this problem of mass incarceration has been happening for a long time. Um, I didn't have to get struck by a lightning bolt of awareness. I, I often say, you don't have to be struck by lightning when it's been raining all your life. I mean, mm. the idea of prison as like the boogeyman under the bed that's coming for your son, your husband, your boyfriend, that is just always, I've always had that kind of as an undercurrent in part of my understanding of what it is to be a black person. So I didn't really worry if it, I never thought prison was gonna go out of style in America, basically. Mm. So mm. I never even thought, will it still be happening? I knew it would be. But I do think that having written it when, before it was such a big national conversation, I think it allowed me more flexibility as an artist to you know, think about the other things in the book, to think about the husband and wife relationship, what's going on with their Love parents. Story. Yes, because sometimes like right now when we're in these moments of grave crisis, it's almost like, you know how we say Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. 
novels are the story of black lives, but during times of crisis, we can come to think that our black lives are only a black problem. Mm -hmm. But when I wrote it, there was just a lot more flexibility to think about the lives of the characters. Well, that's what I thought was so interesting because initially, of course, I knew that there was an element that was about mass incarceration, but I also knew it was a, a love story. And, and I want to talk about the title in a little bit of An American Marriage. I was so worried at first because I've done a lot of reporting recently on um, people who've been wrongfully accused of crimes, uh, other things that have you know, affected the Black community. And I was so worried that this was going to be so torturous and hard for me to read because it would be so painful. While it is painful, what I thought was interesting was that you cloaked this whole problem in the middle of a, a love story. It's all about a couple and trying to figure out their love. Um, there's also the parents of one of them, the, the, the Roy in the, in the book, and the beautiful love story be between his parents. And I thought that was very interesting that prison wasn't the dominant theme, but there was also this, this thinking about the love between the characters, Roy and Celestial, um, how they came together, is that love going to endure? Were you deliberate about trying not to make it so heavy duty about the mass incarceration problem? Or did you want to explore just lives and how that all sort of played into it together? Well, as I was taught as a writer, as I was trained as a writer, is that a good novel is about people and their problems, not problems and their people. Mm. So the people have to come first. And, you know, I'm sure you've had this experience where we've all had challenges in our lives. Like my first book is about growing up in Atlanta during the Atlanta child murders. And I remember once I told someone that I was, that I grew up during the child murders in the late 1970s and early 80s. And someone said to me, oh, you must not have had a childhood. And mm -hmm. I felt that in saying to me that I didn't have a childhood, that, that person was denying the fact of my humanity. Yes, mm. in my childhood. There was a serial murder. There was violence. Two children from my school were murdered, but I was still a child. Like one of the memories I have of that period was going to Sears and Roebuck, getting mm. fitted for this training bra, because I decided that I, time had come that I needed a training bra. And the lady booked out the, the training bra. Measure. And she measured me and my size was a 28 triple A. That's like no <laughs> bra at all. And I was I was put out and I remember I was mad about it. And yeah. <laughs> I looked over at this part of Sears and Robux and the camp and the um, TVs were for sale and they were playing the news. And I saw on the news, a picture of a boy that I had known. Mm. But for me, that childhood moment of being told that you don't really need a bra and, and being mad about, I was mad about it. Mm. And seeing my classmate had been killed, they go together for me. And this, mm. this mass incarceration, Celestial and Roy are a young couple. You know, they're ambitious. They're on the way up. They have some problems in their marriage. You mm -hmm. know why they have problems in their marriage? Because they don't know that they're in a book about mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. they, think, they think that they're a couple living their life like any other couple. And mm -hmm. they're arrested for a crime he doesn't commit. But their details of their coupleness are still there. Right, right. And that was what was so interesting because I'm reading it and I'm thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh, is this the moment? So let's talk about these characters because it's, it, there's, there's Roy and Celestial and then of course there becomes a little triangle there, another character, Andre. But to begin with, um, Celestial is a, um, an a upper middle class young black woman who grew up in Atlanta. Her father did very well after an invention. Roy grew up somewhat close to poor. Um, you know, in Louisiana, small, I mean, very different backgrounds. He went to Morehouse, she went to Spelman, your alma mater. Um, and there's, I, I can't decide if they're ill-suited or they are sort of meant to, to be together. I mean, they clearly seem to love each other, but I get signals early on that they might have trouble in this marriage. He hasn't been entirely faithful. Um, cheater. A little bit of a cheater, but yeah, a little bit, but she loves him. So even in the very beginning, I mean, is, is, is that sort of the, are you setting the, the, the stage for whether or not they have the stuff to make it? This is what I was thinking with them. Like I said, they don't know they're in a book. Mm. They don't know that with Roy's incarceration, they will become symbolic of the black couple and his situation will become symbolic of being the black man. They just think they're two people who are in early stages of a marriage trying to see if it's going to take. Um, mm -hmm. The thing is, you know, there's this moment when Celestial's, when Celestial is a child and her parents say to her, when you're black, you have to work twice as good to get half as much. 
I feel the same thing is happening in their marriage. For a marriage to survive an incarceration, you have to be super couple. You can't mm -hmm. just be a regular couple trying to see if you're well suited, trying to work out your problems. You are asked to do a Herculean thing mm -hmm. to have a marriage, which is something all kinds of other people just do. Right. But for them, they have to move heaven and earth and they get judged as to whether or not they moved heaven and earth. But and they've only been married for about a year. Yes, as she says, we were still counting the time off in months like you do with the baby. Yeah, that writing. I mean, your writing is so lyrical and so beautiful. I just, I mean, it just really grabs me. So let's get to, to, the, to the whole meat of it. So they're trying to figure it out. And, and, and I want to talk about the language between them and the way you sort of captured a guy in this book, too. I want to talk about that later because you got inside the head of men, which I thought was very interesting. But they are trying to figure out if this is going to take. They're going to visit Roy's parents. And they are staying in a, and, and I was, when they decided not to spend the night with the, the parents, but they wanted to go and stay at a, at, a, at a motel. And I was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I just knew that was not you knew they were, But you knew they were in a book. They did not know they were in a book. Yeah. And I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but I felt. So they, they have a fight and, and, and Roy has a chance encounter with this woman and you don't get deeply into it, but eventually he gets, he gets uh, accused of a rape. You don't mention much about the woman. You don't mention her race. You don't tell us much about her. Why? Is that intentional? Well, yes. I mean, I feel like in a novel, everything is intentional. I think sometimes people assign more weight to things than I intended, but everything that's in there is purposeful. But the reason I didn't spend too much time on her is that I was really didn't want to get, I wanted this novel to be about Celestial and Roy and their families. And I felt if I lingered too much on the accusation, on the courtroom, on all of that, that it would become about crime and not about people. Mm. And when you make, when you have a story where a crime is at the center of it, it becomes a story about the state, mm. about the people versus the state. And that right. is in fact a part of it, but I really wanted to be about the couple. So I didn't spend a lot of time on her. I didn't specify her race because I didn't want to I felt like we could get there and we could relitigate Emmett Till and mm. just never get past page 40 of the book. So right. I call myself, as we say here in Georgia, I call myself kind of sliding by that. But when I got the first jacket copy for the book, on the back of the book, it said, Roy, it's an upwardly mobile young black man who was accused of the rape of a white woman. It seemed like that was in all caps, the rape of white, a white woman. White woman, right. I, said, I didn't say she was white. I right, didn't say right. About that, but that was just how that was implied to somebody. Yes, and I that narrative is so strong, right. and I think that narrative is so strong that even if I didn't lean on it, it was there. Right, right. Well, I thought that was interesting because I sort of assumed that she was white, but not really because he and Celestial in some very odd way even sort of felt some sympathy for her. They said that we know something happened to that woman, but it didn't happen to him. We, we, he wasn't responsible. When you describe when that, that moment happens, when he is actually found guilty and he can't believe it because he knows he didn't do it. And the, he screams out and he cries. I mean, that was just heart-wrenching for me and in every reader i'm sure uh, where where did you what informed you about his experience and when he's going to prison you don't give us a lot of great detail about the prison and i'm actually happy that you didn't but what informed you about that and then also this chance encounter in prison with his uh, uh, father uh, 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 uh. Well, that is sorry. the only spoiler in the whole book. Everybody, I'm gonna get my little men in black thing. In I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I figured at this point, they've mostly all read it. I hope they have, because you've got a lot of fans out there. But he has a chance to encounter in prison. They didn't hear what well, I said. I have to say that when plot twists happen in the book, I don't know they're happening either. Roy right. was surprised when he found out about his cellmate. I was just as surprised. Roy <laughs> and I were dumbfounded. That it's threw me for a loop. But me too. All of us. We were all thrown. Everybody was thrown for a loop except for Walter, who <laughs> knew all. Including the author. Wow. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, I didn't know. But the thing is, when I wrote this book the first time, I wrote it from beginning to end from the point of view of Celestial, because I'm interested in women and the ways that women's roles are defined in a changing society. She's an artist. I hadn't really read many books with Black women as artists. So mm. I wrote it from the rooter to the tutor from her point of view. And mm. everyone kept saying, well, what about her husband? What's going on with her husband? And then I felt defensive and I felt like, 
Are you trying to say that a black woman can't tell a story without her husband? I uh, have a lot of male friends who are writers and no one ever says to them right from the point of view of <laughs> So your feminist came out. I was really like, I refuse to accept the idea that a black woman's story is not complete. But mm -hmm. then one thing about being a writer, as opposed to seeing, being, say, a painter. If a painter makes a revision on, on her painting, she'll never have her original again. But as a writer, you print out that draft. You have that draft right here. So if mm -hmm. you find something new, you're not sacrificing anything but your pride. And listen mm. to someone else. So I said, well, let me see what Roy has going on. So I took down one of my typewriters and I was like, let me just check it out. And I was able to write his voice so clearly. It only took me about six months where I had spent two years on her point of view. And, and how did you and how did you do that? Because it really felt as if a, a male author was writing this. I mean, it's some it, it felt like you were conveying a male point of view in a, in a way that somebody had been there. I mean, I'm really serious. I just could not figure out, you know, how you got, how you told it through his mind. I think you could do it because here's the thing. The reason I was able to write his point of view so quickly is that his story and his way of looking at things is something that we've read a lot. Like we, the idea of a black man up against the system, all he wants is to get home and find a faithful woman. Like that is kind of the plot of the Odyssey, which was written at 73 BC. Like this idea that what I want is faithful woman. I just, mm -hmm. and we know this story. And mm -hmm. so I didn't feel comfortable having rewritten a story that I felt had been written so many times. But mm -hmm. when I used her point of view and his together and started alternating them, I said, mm. this is something new. That was an interesting device. Uh, her story, his story. And then there's another uh, man who was in, intro, uh, introduced, Andre. And uh, at a certain point, Celestial is sort of torn. One thing that occurred to me, and I think uh, I asked people on Instagram, my Instagram account, to ask what they, what they wanted to ask you. And some people felt that they weren't really that crazy about Celestial at times. They felt that she wasn't as devoted and dedicated to her man who is in prison that she of course cared, but she was also just as concerned about her own well-being and what her dreams and hopes were. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a story that recently came out and you probably know about it, the WNBA player, mm -hmm. uh, a woman who fought uh, uh, Maya, uh, who, yeah. who fought, Yes, that's right. For a man who is wrongfully in prison, it turns out she fell in love with him. And now they just announced a couple of weeks ago that they were getting married. She dropped everything to fight for this man. But Celestial didn't do that in the book. She didn't drop everything to fight for Roy. Why? Well, I think that one, I think part of it is what I call the tyranny of genre expectation. That if you have a story, you say, this is a story about a, man, a woman and her husband is wrongfully incarcerated. You say, oh, it's one woman's brave fight to free her man. Like mm. that's the story you're expecting. Just in the way when you found out the book was about wrongful incarceration, you thought it was going to be all pain. There's certain stories that we are, are, are taught that that's the story. And we also have this idea that Black women's contribution to the society is the extent to which they can support men. Mm. Like that's the woman's role. And I think that I think that supporting people who are incarcerated is important for everyone. And I also think that women who are incarcerated should be supported. If you go to visit a prison, a men's prison, there's a line around the corner of women. But when you go to a women's prison, hardly anyone visits women in prison. Oh, interesting. And did you do research? Did you visit prisons to sort of inform you to do this? I visited, I visit prisons, you know, just as part of my work as a writer. When I travel all over the world, I ask to go visit prisons. I went and visited mm -hmm. a women's prison in Dubai recently. Um, mm -hmm. But with the thing of the expectation of what women's role is, I do sometimes meet people and they're very angry. They say celestial is selfish, which, you know, is a cardinal sin for women. But mm -hmm. I ask people this, is it selfish not to wait on someone and is it selfish to ask someone to wait on you mm, mm. it's so funny roy says to celestial you know i don't want you to wait for me i don't want you to throw your whole life away then he's like, <laughs> he's like why, you didn't, why didn't you wait for me how dare you not wait for me yeah, it's kind of unreasonable what's put on women and this idea that her contribution to his life is chastity as though she can like as though one black woman's chastity is can unravel the racism of the state of Louisiana, that she is just going to, through cross legs, get him out of prison. That is mm. not how it works. She does not abandon him. 
She does. She pays his legal fees. He would be in prison. If, well, if he was real, he'd be in that's prison true. right now. <laughs> if she hadn't paid his legal, that's true. But, that's but very people true. act like he was devoted. Yes, but people act like still because she started a relationship with Andre. She has somehow, even her own father. Everyone has decided that the moral measure of her life is sexual. Mm. Mm, that's so interesting. And, and, and Maya Moore is the WNBA player I was trying to think of just now who um, helped free Jonathan um, Irons. That was very fascinating too, the expectations. And, and again, not wanting to give it all away, but he was in prison. And I guess, is it all right to say at some point that was not the case? with him because yeah, he, he okay so so i was okay so he's free he's out but, on page 87 but <laughs> but i was really frightened of roy for just a minute when he first came out of prison he was a very different hard possessive uh, hostile guy and it took me a minute to realize wait a second he's been in prison he's been you know he's been treated like an animal this guy has been diminished this is what prison has done to him. And of course, he eventually sort of realizes because there's a scene when the rage comes out and he's sort of fighting with this cherished tree in the yard and he wants to sort of kill her and he wants to kill Andre. And he, the rage was really, really fascinating that he felt when he came out. I was he's, worried. I was very worried about him in that rage. I was very worried. I was afraid that Roy, I thought Roy was going to kill somebody and end up back in prison. And I that's felt, what I was worried about. That's I what I was like, worried Roy, about. Like, Roy, you've been through so much. You've been through so <laughs> much only to go back in prison. And also, I felt like it took me six years. I was thinking, Roy, I've been writing this book as long as you've been in prison. <laughs> and I can't believe you're going to take me through all this and end up back in prison. <laughs> I, was, I was really concerned. Also, I didn't want to write that bleak book. I don't right. like bleak. I was I, worried I was, you would do that. And I was happy you didn't do that. I mean, some people are good at bleak, but this is what I imagine with the novel. I imagine there are two, when I write a novel, I imagine there are two, two groups of readers, right? Like there's like an A track, like remember like on the record, there's the A side and the B side. Right. And the A side for me are the people who know this experience that I'm writing about, people for whom this experience is familiar. And the B side are people who don't know, but need to know. But you have to decide between those audience, what's going to be A and what's going to be B. And I hate the idea that there's a person out there that's experiencing what I'm writing about and my work would diminish their hope. I don't ah. want to walk away from my book feeling worse than they did than when right. they read it. But sometimes when you concentrate too much on the B side, the people who don't know but need to know, it gives you the impulse just to pile it on, pile on the trauma to make those other people see that this is real. But the mm -hmm. damage you do to people who've experienced it when you can't see a glimmer of hope. Right. So, right. so I had to keep revising the end until I found a plausible, hopeful way into the future for the And camera. you did. And you struck that balance very well, too, because you, you made us feel the pain and you made us recognize what is happening. In fact, one of, one of the uh, Andre, the, the love interest of Celestial, says, I know that could have been me, too, as a Black man. So you certainly reminded us that this is a looming issue for Black men in our society, but yet you didn't just hang everything. You painted a beautiful story of a love story between Roy's parents, Olive and Roy Sr. And, you know, the, the the, the, just the pain that this man felt with this woman when he lost her that he had had and, and had such a love affair with. That was such a beautiful story. Was it based on anybody in particular? Um, I think that when the love story is really beautiful, that's when you know I am truly using my imagination. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm terrible. Um, <laughs> I'm bad. I'm the, you're very bad. I'm not um, going to follow that up and get but... you in more trouble. <laughs> but I feel like, you know, what I thought about, there's so many couples in this book. And one thing I learned in writing this is that the couples work out to the extent to which they are compatible and want the same things. Roy, Big Roy and Olive, they're such a compatible couple because they have the thing they have in common is the love of their son. They mm. work their lives around their son. Right. And I don't think those two people will be good couples with anybody else. Mm. Like it's about finding the person that you have just so I don't, I didn't like to say these people are in the relationship for the right reason. These people are doing it for the wrong reason. It only matters that they do it together in a way that works for them. Right. All, right. all of the couples 
And you well, know, I wanna, hmm? go ahead. I was going to say one thing about the parents in this book, all the parents are married or to someone, all the parents and the parents, all they're all on their second relationships. Right, right, but, exactly. But they all want to be the marriage police. They are they're all, all the yes, marriage exactly. police. <laughs> they all want to exactly prophesy the hypocritical ones. You're absolutely right. And they've all sort of done something wrong. Well, I want to open up uh, to, uh, to the um, audience to offer some chats in a second. But I do want to ask you really quickly, in case it doesn't come up, an American marriage. How did you come up with that title? Because it's not a classic American marriage, necessarily, this young couple. Well, I don't know what is classic American. But, um, you know, when I... I'm not good with titles. When I title a book, I'm so extra. I'm like, you know, when you're 15 and you're writing names of your hypothetical children, and it's like all these middle names, accent marks, <laughs> capital letters, it's a lot. And that's right. how I am with titles. And I, my, every time I write a book, they tell me you need a new title. So I turned mm. in the book and they said, you need a new title. And even when I turned in the title, I knew it wasn't gonna stick. I turned in a title because I wanted to make sure the editor read it as a love story, not as a sociological problem of what's going on with Black people today. So mm -hmm. I gave it a real kind of a fluffy title. I knew it was right. thick, but, <laughs> I knew, but I needed to guide him. I needed him because, right. you know, before when I was writing, somebody said to me, um, you know, you could put a little Black Lives Matter in this book. Like I have some Black <laughs> Lives Matter. You know. Right, exactly. Fairy dust or something. But so... Yeah. I said to him, I said, well, you know, maybe we could just call this book an American marriage because when people call things American, people think they're important. I even told mm -hmm. him that my cat, her name is Canella. I said, Canella is writing a book. It's going to be called American Feline. It's going to be huge. Uh -huh. and well, an American marriage does work. I mean, because it leaves it sort of open because there are multiple marriages in here. And, you know, who's to say they're not all classic American marriages? But I didn't like it. I didn't like the title at all because for me, I had never been called American without another word in front of it. Mm -hmm. I've traveled all mm -hmm. over the world and no one ever said, she's an American. I'm always African American. African -American. American. So when they wanted to call it an American marriage, I felt like it wasn't about me anymore. Right, right. Well, listen, I, I want to I want to pause because I know folks are dying to get in here and um, we have been chatting quite a bit. So um, I, I know we have folks out there who maybe want to have questions to you. So please, uh, Give us your questions for Tiara Jones about her book, An American Marriage, and um, I want to hear what you all are thinking. So as we wait for that first question, Dr. Aisha Burke says, mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to ask Dr. Aisha Burke? Uh, she has a question for you. Can, you. can you see it there? I can see all the questions, actually. Okay. So then I, I'm, for some reason, I'm not seeing them. So I'll I'm tell you where, look at the bottom of your screen, put your cursor yes. on the screen. You see at the bottom where it says Q and A bottom to the right. It's like, a little uh, no, I don't. So I'm going to let you take that question then <laughs> because right. I'm having trouble and I'm afraid I may, I may turn it off. Okay. I'll, <laughs> I will, I will, I will shut you down. Here, here is Dr. Burt's question. She says, it was how you intertwine multiple stories to paint such a beautiful story. Thank you. How did you navigate illuminating the loving parts of your main characters and flaws and holding that tension without it being too much? This is what made them real. Okay. What I do with the characters, you know how I kept saying that um, the people don't know they're in a book? You have to keep that in mind the whole time to think of them as real people and don't spend a lot of time asking yourself, well, what does this mean? What are you trying to say? and let them be like real people and let see when your characters kind of know they're in a book they start acting like their mother's watching them and they start <laughs> being on their best behavior and no in the point what you want in a book is in a novel is that you want as a reader to feel that the characters are showing you their real selves in their flaws and their strengths and try not to i try not to take sides and the way i don't take sides is i never write about characters i don't like if I don't have anything good to say about a character, I just don't put them in the book because you'll feel me, you'll feel me pushing against them and it'll tilt the book. Or if I love them too much, love one character more than another, it'll turn the book in that other direction. So I have to just try to make them real. I want it to be where if they were to read the book themselves, they would say, right. yeah, that's what I did. Mark Tenenbaum says he loved the book and wondered, did you wrestle with the balance you gave to Roy and George's marriage and the, in, Roy, well, George's Celestial's marriage and the injustice to Roy, you know, thinking about just mercy, did you wrestle with that? You know, I did have to work really hard not to let a lot of the really disturbing things I found out in my research 
um, run away with me. Because when you do research on a novel, sometimes you get the urge, because like you found out this really interesting statistic. So you have to fight the urge to have the characters suddenly look up and say, did you know? you know, that so many household items are manufactured by people in prison who are paid pennies on the dollar. You know, oh, like wow. you, get, you get that impulse. Yeah, people in prison make all kinds of stuff. And also like, um, sometimes like if you go to a car wash, you know, where they have all those, the car goes through the machine and all those guys are like drying off the car and things. Right. Sometimes they are prison labor and they're making pennies and the corporation is making so much money. So like, I knew that. But mm. I had to like reel it in that mm. that I didn't let it weigh down the story. Mm. It was hard because I wanted I wanted everyone to know. Right, right, and you want to give that, but you, again, you have to decide. This is a novel, and it is a love story. Tammy wants to talk about something that I I found fascinating too. Another device that you use, which is the letters between the two. Roy is writing Celestial from prison. She's writing him back, and the letters start off kind of sort of nice and sweet. Oh my gosh, my love, uh, you know, love Roy, love Celestial. And then they become more terse as he's becoming a little more frustrated. She's getting frustrated. Then it's just Roy. Then it's just Celestial. How did that device come to you to use that for some of your chapters, the letters between the two? It was pretty brilliant. And then they get down to their initials. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Like they've had it. They've had it. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, here's the thing. When I write letters all the time myself, I am a major letter writer. And I've always liked novels, the epistolary novel, but prison is the only place where you can write letters and put letters in a novel in a way that seems realistic and doesn't just seem like you wanted to try and put some letters in a novel. Mm -hmm. People in prison really appreciate mail. I think everyone should go to writeaprisoner.com and find yourself um, a prison pen pal. Um, on, in the holidays, I try to write to women over 50. Um, mm -hmm. in prison. But Prison is two things. It is brutality and it's monotony, which are two mm. things that you don't want to experience vicariously as a reader. But Roy, when he writes to Celestial, he is curating his experience for her so that she doesn't experience everything. And therefore, we don't experience everything. But I had to look for what I call the, the minutia of deprivation. Very uh small details that give you a sense of the emotional experience of prison without so much the blow by blow. Somebody wanted to know about Olive, Roy's mother, uh, and, and the fact that she didn't like Celestial. And she almost sort of uh, predicted that their relationship was going to have problems. Why didn't Olive like Celestial? Olive is not going to like anybody <laughs> around her son. Nobody's good enough for her son. I mean, her here's the challenge with Olive's life is this. Olive is the perfect mother for Roy when he is wrongfully in prison. She mm. raised her son always fearing the worst possible case scenario. And the worst possible case scenario happened. So I guess you could say that she was a, she was a very good mother for him. But yeah. if- She visited him every week. But if the worst thing hadn't happened, I think she would be kind of a nightmare of a mother because she made her son the center of the universe. And mm. I mean, Roy was not at all accustomed to being concerned about other people. Mm. But her devotion to him was just what he needed. I think that's a real challenge for, for Black parents. Do you raise your children for the worst? But being raised for the worst doesn't really equip you to live life when it's not the worst. Right. But what right. can you do? The worst. But everybody wants to shelter their children and make them you know, feel that life is going to be fair and that life is going to be um, good to you. But you know, she's next level. This woman had her tubes tied so that her son would not have experience <laughs> siblings. <laughs> like, I forgot about like, that part. Yeah, no, like she really, I mean, she's hooking him up from the grave. Right, like right, she, right. But that is what he needed. But it also made her a nightmare of a mother-in-law. Right, right. Pam wants to know what was the inspiration for the story? Did you start with the idea of incarceration and then work in the relationship? Or did you take the relationship and then work in incarceration because it's something that is so prevalent in society? I thought that I want, this is my fourth novel, and my first three novels were very personal, um, many kind of inspired by my own experiences. And for my fourth novel, I wanted to try and think about a larger issue, something. And also, I kind of resisted writing about societal issues because I felt as a Black person, everybody mm -hmm. wanted me to write a book about racism. Right, right. right. Everybody I, assumes that that's your experience. I'm like, there's more to my life than racism. But <laughs> I decided, well, let me, 
I looked into this incarceration. I took a grant to go to Harvard and research it, and I discovered all these things. But I was angry. I was outraged, but I wasn't inspired because stories live in a place of moral ambiguity. And when I was looking at wrongful imprisonment, I mean, they call it wrongful imprisonment because it's wrong. So I didn't have any, any space for back and forth. But I went and I was in the mall here in Atlanta and I saw a young couple in the mall arguing and the woman said, Roy, you know you wouldn't have waited on me for seven years. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. This wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. You heard a couple say that? Mm -hmm. That's because that's verbatim what happened in like, the book. Okay, that's a novel. I think about them though. You know, he might have just been in the Peace Corps. Who knows? <laughs> But my imagination folded then he had the gone away to prison. You know, uh, if somebody wanted to ask you about um, the next novel, but before we get to that, I thought without, again, giving completely away the ending, someone asked on my Instagram live about whether you let Celestial off the hook by, you know, letting her have a happy ending. But I also felt that Roy had a good ending too. Were they, in your mind, were they, was this couple just kind of destined maybe not to make it? I mean, they both found their happiness, I think, right? I would say, sometimes people say I let her off the hook because they want me to punish her. Mm. They want me to punish her for not living up to what they see are the standards of black female expectation. Mm. So they need, the fact that I decided not to make her life miserable. I mean, we get so, think about it, so many movies. People want the, the, good, the good person and the bad person in these novels, right? Yes, and they want to punish women. When, when people claim to like independent women, but when women behave independently, people True. actually get mad. They like I, it in theory. Right. So I, I don't, I tell people, people say, did you let her off the hook? I'm like, I'm not in the hook business. That's not what I do. <laughs> I try to look at ways that people can have healthy interactions and healthy relationships. And I think that all of them grew up and moved forward in a way that was healthy for them. And if I can just say one other thing, because about Celestial and Roy, Roy and Celestial, you know, their marriage is kind of tricky, but also, I mean, Roy looks at Celestial as a symbol of his upward mobility. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that the way that we judge men and women is so different. If I were to write a book about a woman who was so happy about marrying up, people would just be like, you can't let her off the hook. She's, <laughs> she's, a, gold she's yeah. a gold digger. She's a gold digger. I feel like Celestial can't, I feel like Celestial, if she does anything other than complete sacrifice, she can't win because okay. that's the only way we've been taught to respect women for complete and total sacrifice. One thing I think about Roy, one thing that Roy had to learn in this book is that Roy had to learn to think of other people because all of his life, everyone he's ever met has completely doted on him. When he's an infant, his stepfather is like, I'll make you my son. I'll give you right. my name. Like right. I said, his mother's like, I'll have my tube ties. You don't need siblings. <laughs> he goes to high school. The teacher's like, you should see the world. I'll say for you, get a passport. He goes to Morehouse. They're like, you should have a scholarship because you're a special person. He gets right. in prison. His prison cellmate is like, I'll have you as my son. He gets out of prison. He meets Davina. And she says, you know what? You need some restorative sex. Like everyone he has it's ever catering. met. Interesting. Yes, Interesting. Interesting. And, and meanwhile, Celestial is just trying to honor who she is and, and who, who she wants to be. And, and I felt uneasy about that. And you're absolutely right. I mean, she's a woman and she... She felt for Roy, but she wanted to be her own person and she was worried about her own life too as a young 30 something year old woman who was trying to make it in the world. So, I mean, you have a very good point there. Um, Connie wanted to know about the Atlanta references. She is an Atlanta native. She wanted to know how you sort of chose, she recognized so many of the Atlanta references and I'm guessing because you're an Atlantan. She's wondering why you chose that as yes, you're where, where did Connie go to high school? Um, I don't know. Did you say where you went to high school? She just said, I'm an Atlantan and she wanted to know about the references. Maybe Connie will come back and ask us and tell us that. Because I'm such an Atlantan that I have to know that before I go forward. But <laughs> Maybe I know your people. Yes, well, I'll say I'm, I, was born <laughs> raised, I was born and raised in Southwest Atlanta. I'm a graduate of Benjamin Elijah Mays High School. I'm graduate undergraduate of Spelman College. So Atlanta is my, it's my natural habitat and it is my creative wheelhouse. I think that the South has been really distorted in literature. People think that Southern literature is about grandmamas and mules. Mm. You know, I did have a grandmama, but I have never even seen a mule. I wouldn't know a mule if it walked in here. So the <laughs> urban Southern experience, I think is 
so underrepresented. So right. when I started writing about Atlanta in the first place, it's just because it was my hometown. But like when I moved to Brooklyn and I would tell people I was from Atlanta, they would act like I got to um, Brooklyn on the Underground Railroad. So <laughs> I felt like I really needed to represent for my hometown and make right. a, a, and I wanted to make a clear remembrance of the city as I knew it because the city is changing a lot. Mm. And so novels can get the little details that probably will never appear in any history book. Well, one detail is that one of the characters is a tree and Jeep Faison wants to ask about the tree, old old hickory. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's a prominent, um, it has a prominent place in Celestial's up, uh, memory and this tree in the yard. And at, at some point that tree is under attack by Roy. Um, somebody, Jeep Faison wants to know where that came from. Um, there was a tree in the yard when I grew up. It's still there. Um, and Atlanta is a city built among the trees. We have so many trees. If you want to cut down a tree in Atlanta that's bigger than um, six inches around, which is the circumference of my wrist, you have to get permission from the city to cut it down. We don't play about our trees. <laughs> so I wanted, well, you made that very clear. I wanted to capture that part. And I like the tree as a symbol. One thing that's interesting is that on the US cover is the tree with more emphasis on the branches and the trunk. And in mm. some other countries, they have they have yeah. a picture of the roots of the tree, and I was ah. is a tree more its branches or its roots? Oh, interesting, interesting. Nancy wants to know about the doll. Celestial is an artist, and she makes a particular kind of artwork. And she said she almost wanted to see it. And I was thinking the same thing. You know, how did where did that come from? This creative spirit of this woman who's creating these dolls. I mean, in the book, of course, she learned that after a trauma that had happened to her. But where did that come from for you? I have a girlfriend who is a doll maker. Her name is Cosby, C-O-Z-B-I, should you Google her, Cosby's Dolls. And she is just, just a beautiful artist. And one thing about women artists is that it's very hard to be taken seriously. Cosby can spend months on dolls. Mm. He has to wear the magnifying glasses and do all the detailing. Her work is just exquisite. But as a woman artist, it's, especially she makes dolls. Like when I'm on a plane as an, and I'll be sitting next to a man in first class and he'll say, so what do you do? Which means, what are you doing up here in first class? <laughs> say, I'm a writer. And he'll say, oh, have you written a romance novel? And I'll say, no, uh -huh. I've written a novel about the collateral effects of wrongful incarceration. And uh -huh. he'll say, oh, I'll buy it for my wife. And I feel like when with Celestial as a doll maker, she spends all this time and people think her art is toys for girls. Right. Right, right, right. Yvette here says she went, she's in Atlanta and then she went to Douglas High School. She just wants <gasps> you to know that. We will still be friends. I went to Maine. <laughs> still be um, I think we're going to be wrapping up here in a second, but Dolores Perry wants to know, why do you think Roy's tooth was so important to him after he got it? Um, and how was that satisfying? He had gotten his tooth knocked out when he was trying to court Celestial. He fell and knocked his tooth out. Why was that so important to him at the end? You know, when you lose your tooth, I mean, that changes your face in a way that, like when Roy gets out of prison, you know, he's lost, because he had a, a bridge, but he lost that in prison. They don't do cosmetics in prison. Mm -hmm. And every time he smiles, it's like he's a different person. That right. kind of shock. It covers his mouth, yes. Yeah. And, and when you see someone, they're missing a front tooth, it sends a very different message about who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, that tooth is part of my body. It is part of me. I want it to be complete, to be complete. Mm. And, and then he also just gets kind of caught up in the symbolism of it himself. And he's just, he's just on a tear. I mean, he's on man, a tear. Man has he was lost, feeling it. He's lost so much. Right, he's right. Lost so much. And that just, I felt so bad for him. There, yeah. I went, I alternated between feeling so bad for him and wanting to shake him. I felt like that about <laughs> all of them. I felt that way too. There were times I felt like I wanted to just shake them. I was like, these people are really getting on my nerves at a certain point. Um, I think we have time for one last question, I'm told. And let's see here. This one is from Terry, who wants to know, um, the back and forth between Celestial and Roy and Dre was so good. How did you manage Dre as a good guy and not a bad guy? Because he did come across as a guy who was sort of caught in the middle and he was a good guy. How did you manage that? Well, here's the thing. And I'm going to say something after this, because I, I can't end on this. I have one more thing to say, but I will say this. Okay, Dre is the boy next door. There are some people who- Literally are, in this case, yeah, yes. Some people are really mad at Dre because they felt like they like he was just waiting for his opportunity. And I'm kind of like, how did you, how do you, what do you think? You think he put Roy in prison? He did not. But he's the boy next door. And 
in American stories, the reason boys are next door is so you can grow up and come to your senses and marry them. That's why they live over there in the first place. But I feel like in this, in the context of Roy's incarceration, even accepted tropes like the boy next door don't count anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I just got into, into Andre's heart. He's loved her since he was a baby. And then some people hold that against him, but they think that think they think that makes him weak. But I think it's also because they're not accustomed to seeing someone cherish a black woman all their life. So it's mm -hmm. like his love for her then becomes they cast suspicion on like, what do you mean he's loved her since he was a baby? But I think that's sweet. They used to take they a They grew up together. In the sink. And right. I just I just had him be true to himself. He never told a lie. Right. He never hurt anyone. And he does not fight Roy. Back. Right. I mean, I thought Roy was going to kill him and he didn't I fight did him. Too. You wanted to say one more thing before um, yes, they I take over from thing. us. I'll make, it, I'll make it really fast. But I have to say this because I know there's someone listening who needs to hear this. I know there's someone listening to this that has a book they want to write. And mm -hmm. I know that someone here thinks that they can't write their book because they're busy, because they have kids, because they work, because they have elder care, all these things. Because people tell you, if you're a writer, you have to write every day. You do not. You just have mm. to write frequently, not every day. I write three days a week when other people are in the gym. That is enough time to write. <laughs> because listen to me, the things that make it where you don't have time to write every day, these are the very things that are gonna make your work rich and interesting. I don't want to read a book by somebody who sits around the house all day and does nothing. I want to read a book by that mother. I want to read a book by that person with a job. I want to read a book by the person that's doing elder care. I want to read a book by busy people. So be busy, enrich your life, enrich your imagination, and just set some time aside. And you will write that book slowly, one page at a time. You write a book like gaining weight. You didn't gain that weight in one day. You gain that weight one page at a time. And then right. you look up and like, ooh, okay, something happened here. <laughs> That's the way you will be with your book. Just one page at a time and they will accumulate and you will be able to tell your story. Well, budding authors really, really appreciate that. And there are so many people who are. Uh, are you already working on that next one? Or have I you finished am. it? I am. Well, you know, I, what I did this summer was I wrote some pieces for Audible. I have one up on Audible now called Half Light. It's an Audible original. It is light and fun because I started it before the apocalypse. And then I have another one coming out that is a little darker because the apocalypse. But now it's time for me. Write, I'm writing a novel, another novel about Atlanta and gentrification. It's about a woman who grew up in Atlanta um, on the Southwest side. She moves away to New York as one does, and she comes back and she moves into the exact same house she grew up in, except now the neighborhood is gentrified and it's a fabulous house. But when she grew up, it was kind of, wasn't quite together, you know, the right. porch had holes in it, but now it's, you know, completely gentrified craftsmen. And so she can so the question is, can you gentrify your own neighborhood? Ah, and can you find happiness there too? That's so interesting. You are such a brilliant writer. And I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you and you're a Georgia girl and all of that, but you are such a brilliant writer. And I want you to know all my sisters are reading this book. I sent the, one to all of them. One had already read it and others are reading it. So I don't know if they finished yet, but we are. And I said to them, we have to finish because we're going to have a book club all of us, and we're going to talk about the book. So um, Tiara Jones, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. An American marriage, Thank so you. great, so great. And I, and I always like to ask this when I'm interviewing people for Good Morning America, who would play Celestial and who would play Roy in the movie if this were going to go Hollywood? I can't say because... Are we breaking some news here? Now, see, I wish I could like, I'm like, I'm muted. <laughs> may be happening along that that line is that what you're saying that's what i'm saying oh, this is great this is great well congratulations you deserve every bit of it and i can't wait and once we're muted you'll tell me the whole detail <laughs> <laughs> thank you such a pleasure and thank you all for joining in on this chat it was such a such a pleasure and it was worth missing dinner for <laughs> deborah and tiari i would like to thank you so much for joining us tonight i know the viewers enjoyed this as much as I did. What a rich, immense um, moment and something so needed tonight. And I especially want to say, you know, the joy of books is the adventure that we take. 
but this was a special adventure. Being a girl from Southwest Atlanta, I can't tell you the joy it was to see um, pieces of myself in that story and places that I frequent all the time. I'm up and down Cascade every night. Both of the graduates that we're speaking with today have strong connections to the University of Georgia, and we can't thank them enough for sharing their time with us today. We're happy to honor the 20th anniversary of the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame, which celebrates writers like Tiari, who was inducted in 2018. The Georgia Writers Hall of Fame virtual program takes place Sunday, November 8th at 4 p.m. You can learn more at georgiawritershalloffame.org. At UGA, you know we never bark alone. We offer career development resources, opportunities for social and professional networking, and lifelong learning experiences, even from our own living rooms. So if you enjoyed this evening's program, please stay in touch with us to learn more about opportunities to connect. If tonight's discussion inspired you to support one of the causes discussed this evening, we encourage you to donate to one of the funds at UGA designated to support students who are studying to solve some of these problems. You can email us at alumni at uga.edu or follow up in the survey we are sending you. And we can help direct you to the right fund. We're looking forward to announcing our new, our new and next book um, selection in the coming days, along with the accompanying virtual Q&A event. So stay tuned, that will be in November. Remember, this is a part of the Between the Pages series. And if you'd like to learn more, you can visit alumni.uga.edu backslash BTP. Remember to follow Deborah and Tiari on Instagram and Facebook. Good night to you all. And as always, go dogs.